said, I want to give you a very brief overview of uh, India. Let me give you a couple of minutes of history of India. Then we'll talk about the country as a whole. You know, what kinds of religions do they have? What languages do they speak? Then I'll also spend a few minutes about some of the key features of India. What kind of government do they have? What are the major cities? What are other notable aspects, so to say? And finally, what kinds of changes are taking place in the society? So that should take about 15 minutes, as I said. So let me get started with the brief history of India. In fact, if I yeah. ask many of you, most of you would know that India got its independence from Britain, right? But actually, British were the last of the Mohicans to come to India. Long before that, Alexander the Great came to India. This was BC, 320 BC or so. In fact, he came up to Afghanistan and what is now Pakistan and Punjab. And he came very early. In fact, I think before I do that, I may even want to show you a map of India. India is in Asia. Just to give you where it is, you know, it's to the south of China, and here is the Himalayan mountains, and here is Nepal, right? And if you look on this side, this is Burma, or what is now Myanmar, and there is Vietnam and Thailand to this side, Malaysia, Singapore, and all that. Out here is Pakistan, what used to be called West of Pakistan, and Bangladesh is here. Right, East of Pakistan. That's a general map of India. And I should tell you, Alan, you visited some of these places, right? Here is Agra, there, Taj Mahal is. And then you went to, I believe, Jaipur and New Delhi also. Mm -hmm. And then you went down to the state of Kerala, out in the south, many other places. So that's a general map of India. Let me also show you quickly four major cities in India. I come from this place called, now called Chennai. It used to be called Madras or Madras. Have you heard of Madras shirts and all the very old things? <coughs> Textiles. But um, that is Madras, now called Chennai. Why they want to change the name from Madras to Chennai? It's a different story. It's all political. Here is Calcutta. Now they change the name to another place very similar. Here is Mumbai, or known as Bombay. And here is uh, New Delhi, which is the capital of India. Just to very, uh, give you how uh, big the country is, from the southern end to the northern end, it's around 2,000 miles. And between Calcutta and the widest, uh, the width is around 1,200 miles. It's a fairly sizable country, big country, about one third the size of the U.S. Of course, it has about three times the population of uh, the U.S. That's a different story. So that's a general map of India. You have an idea of where it is. Are you folks following me? I'm speaking too fast. No accent, right? <laughs> okay. So I told you, Alexander the Great came uh, before 320 BC. And then we had um, several centuries, centuries of rule by the Mughals and the uh, Islamic uh, forces coming from Central Asia and Russia, came through Afghanistan and Punjab and all that. Then we had uh, folks uh, uh, from Portugal. Portuguese came, the French people came, the Dutch came. And finally, the British people also came. They ruled India for close to 200, 220 years. Good thing is, they talk as many of us English or something resembling English. So good thing I can talk to you with that. Then, around 1947, India got independence uh, in 1947. So the British ruled India for about 200 years. Then in 1947, what was then in India became two independent nations, India and Pakistan. 
In fact, Pakistan was uh, in two parts, the West Pakistan and East Pakistan, separated by 1,000 miles of Indian territory. And in 1970, around that time, um, East Pakistan um, rebelled and it became Bangladesh. Okay, that's a one and a half minute overview of the history of India. So, because of people from all over the world coming to India, they all left their mark, so to say. So, there is wide diversity in India. In fact, some people call it the museum of people. Where do I say that? If you go near Punjab and near Kashmir, people are generally fair, tall, some of them with even green eyes. Maybe some contributions by many of the Greeks who came to India. But anyway, they are tall and fair. Whereas, you know, if you go down to the southern part of India, people are generally darker, with curly hair and all that. So you have a variety of people. Then, talking about, about religions, there are seven, eight major religions in India, right? Hindus represent about 80% of the population. Then the Muslims represent about 15% of the population are about 130 million Muslims in India. I believe India is the third largest, uh, India has the third largest Muslim population in the world. Then we have 2% of the population are Christians. And then we have the Buddhists and the Jains and the Parsis and a whole bunch of other religions. So, then let's talk about languages. Some scholars say India has more than 100 major languages, right? Um, there are two major groups of languages up in the north, usually Sanskrit and Hindi based languages. And then in the south, we have what's our, what are called Dravidian languages, Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, whole bunch of things. If I mention the names, it wouldn't mean anything to you. So the point I'm trying to make is, if you go from, above, if you go about 50 miles or 100 miles from the village you were born, it's quite likely they'll be speaking an entirely different language. Quite likely. So when India became independent, English became one of the official languages in India. Hindi is the another official language spoken by roughly 20, 25% of the population. So 70% of the population doesn't understand a truly Indian official language. Of course, they go to movies, they understand some of the song and the dance, if you know what I mean, but they may not understand the language. So communication becomes very difficult even if they try. If I can spend a couple of couple of minutes about some of the notable features of India, it's a highly uh, populated country. We all know China has the most population in the world, about um, 1.6 billion, something like that. And India has the, is the second most populous nation in the world. Leah, were you about to say something? Yeah. No? Okay. I'm just saying that's crazy as well. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's just a lot of people in China. Oh, a lot of people in China, <laughs> yes. Yeah, India too. Um, it's um, actually a quite poor nation now, poor, in, in terms of per capita income, a lot of people there, some of them make a lot of money, but most of them don't make a lot of money. Average per capita income is quite low, so to say. The funny thing is, at one time, India was considered to be the richest nation in the world. That's why all the people, Alexander the Great came, the Muslims from Russia came, the Portuguese came, the French came, the British came. The British didn't come to give us money. They came to sell their clothes and all that. You know all that. You have had history with them too. Nothing bad about them, but the point is, 
At one time, India had a lot of money, a lot of gold and jewels and all that. Uh, in spite of being a poor nation and all that stuff, it's a functioning democracy. Just like this country, just like Britain and all that. We have a federal government, and there are about, at one time we had 15 states in India. You have 50 states in this country, at one time India had 15 states. Now for a number of reasons, the number of states have gone up to like 25 or 26. Each one of the state again has a, a parliamentary system. Every five years they hold elections. Close to 800 million people go and vote. The uh, percentage of uh, participation is something like 70 or 72. 72 percent of the population go and actually vote. That kind of a thing. We can call it a functioning democracy. How functioning? Well, we are not so sure about that. But nonetheless, on paper, it's a democracy. In reality, it's true. But there are some issues. Now, India is also a primarily agricultural-based country. 70% of Indians are used to live in villages, right? But in addition to being an agricultural country, there's a lot of industries. They make everything from cars to computers and, uh, sorry to say, atomic reactors and all that stuff. In fact, in the place where I come from in Madras, or Chennai, uh, we have a Hyundai car manufacturing. In fact, Madras is known as the Detroit of India. <laughs> and I know Detroit is not doing too well now, but we get the idea, right? In fact, BMW has a factory, Ford Motor has a factory. Part of the reason is because they have lots of engineers and you don't have to pay them too high a salary. And it's nearer to the seashore and all that you can export it to. Africa and rest of Asia. I believe those are the reasons why they have, uh, all of them have their factories, right? Um, in addition to cars and all, we have lots of computer, at least software companies. I bet every one of you have got a call from some guy wanting to sell some software. <laughs> My advice is don't buy it. But anyway, I guess I'm going to be in trouble for that. <laughs> I mentioned to you about the number of legions, also mentioned about uh, uh, the languages. Now, I'm having a little bit of issue with that. How much time do I have now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay. Yeah. Now, before I uh, go back to my prepared remarks, is there any question you would like to ask at this time? What is the population of India? I believe it's around 1.2 billion people. 1.2 or 1.1. It's about three times. The U.S.'s population is around 320 million. So around slightly more than three times. Slightly. Three, four times, yeah. The names of the cities? Yeah. Bombay is, uh, used to be called Bombay, now it's called Mumbai. Madras is now called Chennai and all that. I think one thing that comes to my mind is politics, for political reasons. You know, which reminds me, is there used to be a, somebody who had a definition of politics. If I remember correctly, it says, politics is the art of looking for trouble, <laughs> finding it everywhere, diagnosing it incorrectly, and applying the wrong remedies. <laughs> so I don't quite understand. Apparently, there is some political mileage people get out of changing the names. It's a bit more complicated, but I don't want to burden you with that. But I believe politics is the main reason. 
Yeah. Uh, why are the uh, why are the state of the the states breaking into smaller states? Yeah. I'm wondering, assume it's politics, but is there anything unusual about it? Is it is it a money thing, a religion thing, or? Well, yeah. The um, I want to make sure I understand your question. At the time of independence, India had 15 states. Now there are 26, 27. The reason why is one is because India is a big country, some of the states are indeed very big. But then, because India is democratic, if you can attract a whole bunch of people, you get to become the chief minister, right? So lots of people want to be chief ministers and not, you know, looking for a job or something. So they want to start a party, they attract a lot of attention. So the more states, there are more governors, more chief ministers, more political power. So their parliament in the state, um, the people within that state would vote to separate? Yes, absolutely. No, that's not the only thing. They can't vote to separate. It has to be, law has to be passed in the parliament and the president has to approve and all that. But there are ways of making them do all that by starting writing and you know, burning up a few um, transport vehicles, a whole bunch of things. I'm simplifying. It's not that easy. But believe me, it's that easy. That's all it is when you have me. Yes? Uh, sorry, I'm fascinated by India. So, um, is there what we might call a middle class, a large population of middle class, or um, can you talk about that? Okay. There is a large middle class. In fact, out of the population of 1.3 billion people, some estimates are as high as 400 to 450 million middle class people. Now, the definition of middle class there may be different from what you are used to. There are a lot of poor people. Believe me, there are a lot of very rich people too. They can buy half of Manhattan. Some of them do too. Uh, half the Trump Towers, I believe, is owned by a few <coughs> Indians. But I'm jealous, so that's why I'm telling you. <laughs> but there is a large middle class, especially after 1990 when India's economy has opened up. Before that, we had a socialistic pattern of society. If you want to start an industry, you have to get a license from the central government, right? So you didn't have the freedom to start industries like you would want to. But all that changed in 1990, then India went through some significant economic challenges. The then Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, is the one who opened up the economy. <coughs> India always had a sizable uh, private enterprise, a lot of good business people, but they were stymied. But after 1990, all most of the controls were lifted and you know opened up the country, the, the industry for people to start any business. And around the same time, the computer revolution came on, and the learning languages were a lot easier than you know, learning something else. So there is a sizable middle class. Right? Yeah. yeah, I need to finish it. Yeah, I get the clarion call here. So that is a yeah, very quick overview of India. Now, if I can make a request, my friend Alan Sherman has a lot of interesting things, so I would like to request you to pay particular attention. Not only because he has a lot of interesting things, if you think I have an accent, wait till you hear him, so you better pay good attention, otherwise you would miss it all. So with that, let me turn it over to Alan. So what I, what I would like to do is give you um, a, um, my experience through some of the photographs and try to tie in with some of the themes that Ram has talked about. Uh, so I hope we can do that um, so that it's interesting to you. So I'd like to start with uh, what I knew about India before I left. Um, I knew he came from India, Gandhi. I knew the Taj Mahal was in India. I have seen snake charmers. in India. I didn't realize they were painted up quite as nicely as that. I heard there were cattle in the street, and there are. I heard that the river Ganges 
played a special role uh, in the lives of the Indian people, and it does. It was wedding season, and I had seen monsoon weddings, so I thought that I was prepared for that. I wasn't, but <laughs> I knew there was music in India, the tabla and the sitar. I knew that some of the cities were very modern. We are taking a swim in an infinity pool on the on the one of the top floors of a hotel, and all of this new construction is going on, and the American flag is by an embassy in Mumbai. I'd also heard that there were crowded streets, and it was it was a different kind of India. There was lots of traffic. The traffic was unbelievable. Just and there was great food in India, lots of spices. So my wife and I um, decided that we were going to go and we were due to leave um, the day that Storm Juno came in. So we, so we missed our first day, we were lucky to get on a second flight, so we left Bradley. We went to Newark and 14 hours after we took off, we were in Delhi. And um, it was really a lovely time to go. The, the uh, we, were, we left around January 23rd, and the temperature in northern India was probably around 70 during the daytime. It got down to maybe 40 in the evening, but it was so comfortable. I think we saw rain one day that we, in the three weeks that we were there. Uh, the flag of India. Um, let me just tell you what, the, what some of these colors mean. The saffron at the top stands for courage and sacrifice. The white stands for truth and peace. The green symbolizes faith and strength. And in the middle is a stylized uh, spinning wheel uh, that represents the hope of the masses. So I'm not gonna organize this as a travel log, uh, so you're not gonna go with me as I went to these different places, but I thought I would show you a little bit about some religious, the religious parts of India. And um, starting with something familiar, in the state of Kerala in the south, uh, which, where it was quite tropical. We stopped at a, um, a Christian church, and so the, the symbols and the iconography are familiar to you. And we happened to be there the day that a funeral procession was getting started, so these two gentlemen were uh, musicians in the procession to start, and eventually they did, and the small procession went into the church and they had their, had their ceremony. So there was the Christianity. Do you think you can see better if the lights are low? We can try that. Do you sure. want to? city of Cochin, or Kochi, which is, which is also quite far in the south, um, there is a, a Jewish presence, and I don't think most people think about there being a, a Jewish presence in India, um, but uh, it, it's, it's, um, it's quite dramatic, and uh, this, was a, this was one picture that was, um, point, points the way to the Jewish cemetery. The, um, the synagogue where this was taken uh, was built in around the 16th century, so it's quite old. And, it, and um, the sign there says that the, there's a slab that was taken out of the original building that was here in the 14th century. Um, we were not allowed to take pictures inside some of the religious buildings, this being one of them. So I, I have only a little something here to, to prove that it happened. This is the Jewish cemetery. Um, there is a Buddhist presence in the country, and in the town of uh, Sarnath, which is near Varanasi, Varanasi is on the Ganges, and it was to the east of that triang triangular uh, section that, that Ron pointed out in the north, and this uh, site is supposed to be where Buddha gave his first um, lecture, his first sermon to, uh, to five disciples. 
So there's a small temple here and some beautiful um, statues inside. And then outside is a, um, there's a mock-up of, of, of Buddha giving his sermon. Quite a colorful place, and there were quite a few people there. Some pilgrims who were there praying. I love the prayer flags. And this reminded me a lot of what I'd expect to see in Tibet with the prayer um, barrels. I'm not quite sure how they how they work, but uh, lots of people visiting. Then there's a Muslim presence and. Back in Delhi, there is a um, there's a mosque called the Jama Masjid, and it is the largest uh, Muslim mosque in uh, in the country. Uh, you're on the street, you can see it. You, uh, when you're up on the top, you can look out and see the city, and eventually you work your way in. whole area where people are walking ultimately get filled with prayer rugs, lots of people. And we were there fairly early in the morning, and uh, so the workers were laying down the rugs, and uh, depending on the day and the time, uh, the place is filled with worship. Interiors are, are amazing as well. The architecture is quite something. Um, if I was a better photographer, I might be able to capture some of this, the details on the inside. Um, a little of the old and the new together in this picture. I didn't know much about the Sikh, the, the Sikh presence in India. This is a Sikh temple. It's a religion that actually began in around the 15th century, and it rejected the caste system that the Hindus had set up. And they prided themselves on, on believing in one God and uh, expecting that everyone was equal in the sight of their God. These are some Sikhs who, um, I think we, we probably paid them a little money to pose for us. But one of the things that I learned about them, which was interesting, is that there are five words that begin with K uh, in, in the language that, uh, that signify things that are connected with the Sikhs. One of them is um, they have long, uncut hair, which is one of the reasons that they, are, that they wear the turbans. Um, they have these wooden combs that they carry with them. It's supposed to represent uh, hygiene and discipline. They wear iron bracelets, which are a symbol of strength. Uh, they have special undergarments, which um, have a significance. And they have these daggers, uh, which are ceremonial and represent in part the struggle against injustices. This was one of the Sikhs who was working at the temple, pilgrims. When you go in, uh, you need to have a head cover. This was another place also where you were not allowed to take pictures on the inside. One of the things that happens at the Sikh temple, which I thought was really interesting, was that they feed anybody who comes. And this gentleman was um, sitting at the entrance to one of the food stores, and people donated food. And then you walk into the kitchen area and see what they're doing with this food. The scale is unbelievable. There, there are assembly lines of people rolling out uh, dough, making chapati, getting it ready for the relatively simple meal that they will serve everyone. And this is all going a mile a minute. All of this will be served. Picture, but you look at the glass, and people go in, fill, fill the, 
fill the hall, they sit down, and they are served a tray of food, which will sustain them. Um, the Hindu site that I'm going to focus on is in Varanasi, which was, which was the new name for Benares, which is on the Ganges, and that's uh, towards the eastern, central eastern part of the, the country. Um, we were actually there in the evening at the beginning. I'm going to, I think I'm going to take you through starting with the daytime. But uh, the ghats mm -hmm. are, the, are the walkways down to the water. And these are teeming with people. Uh, this gentleman is selling marigolds and selling them on these little uh, containers which people can uh, uh, make a prayer on and then set, set into the Ganges and let, them, let it float. Dusk is falling, and this this site where the little colored umbrellas are become very important in a moment. This is the scene at night. Um, a lot of the tourists are there in, in boats because it's easier to see if you're on the water looking back in. It also made it very difficult to take pictures because the light was low and the, and the boat was rocking. But um, even with a cloudy picture, you can get a sense of what that must have felt like. And every night, <clears throat> there, is a, there is a ceremony called the RT ceremony, A-R-T-I. It is to honor um, the, the mother Ganges. And there are some priests who are holding uh, some uh, torches, some, some lamps flame coming out of them. I think there are five or seven of them all together, and they are doing a, a ritual dance. There's a close-up of, of them, and it's all done to music, and it's all quite moving. This was um, the best I could do as we moved closer to the cremation site. Uh, you're actually asked not to take pictures of the cremation site, so we still had a ways to go on the boat before we before we got to it. Um, it's quite moving. The flames are going. Um, you know that there are families who have lost loved ones. You know that the that the cost of having a, a funeral a cremation in Varanasi is not small, and for some families this was a a, a real hardship. But something that they. This is sunrise. We were back early the next morning. It's a very peaceful place. And people say, well, isn't the Ganges really dirty and filled with all sorts of trash? And I have to say, it, it didn't look that way to me. And it, and it did not smell. It was just a really nice, peaceful um, place to be early in the morning. Um, not to say there aren't people there. These are the gods. And one of the things that's happening when the monsoons come, the waters rise, and we're told that a lot of this stuff is underwater. And that's, that's hard to imagine, because there's so much life there during uh, the dry season when we were there. People taking selfies. Wouldn't be a trip without that. Um, a lot of people going down to the ghats to worship. This is a holy man who is um, naked, covered with some sort of white powder. Um, one, of, one of the fun things that happened when we were there, the newspaper uh, had an article about the fact that they were now going to have Wi-Fi presence on the ghats. So everybody from the tourists to the holy men could, uh, could check their cell phones and see what was going on. This gentleman was doing a very um, uh, interesting uh, ceremonial dance when we were there. This was our tour leader on the right, um, and uh, she was getting a blessing from this holy man. People do come down to bathe in the river. It's cold.
Y al final. So men um, pretty much disrobe as much as they're going to disrobe um, wherever they are. The women um, have a slightly different game. They they do have these enclosures uh, where they go in and get into whatever um, swimming clothes they're going to they're going to be wearing. And then on the river, you've got to have refreshments. Just traveling up and down the river to see what what else is going on. Um, the color, the laundry getting done. It's so vibrant. It's there's so much going. When we got to the end of our um, time there, we, we were at a location where a lot down near the, um, the cremation, where the cremations are taking place, and the wood is stored down there. And there's wood all over the place. We were told that it takes something like 700 pounds of wood uh, in one cremation. And so this is constantly getting shipped in, and of course it has to get piled up, and then of course it has to get brought down to the, uh, to the sites. Okay, it's wedding season. It's the dry season. And um, we didn't really know what to expect, except when we were driving around, uh, occasionally we would come to these sites that uh, looked like they were enclosed, but there was always this colorful red um, indicators that there was a wedding reception going on. We never saw the, uh, the wedding itself, but the receptions were going on all the time. And um, our tour guide stopped and ask the folks whose family was, was running this one uh, if, if the curious Americans could get off the bus and take a look. And so they let us in, and, and they couldn't have been nicer. It was, I mean, I just can't imagine this happening in an American wedding. <laughs> but the, um, the bride and the groom were there. The, uh, the statue in the middle is Ganesh. Ganesh is the elephant-headed god who um, I'm sure you've all seen. Uh, he is a god of um, wisdom and learning and a remover of obstacles. So he's a very auspicious god to have uh, as you're starting a marriage. There's another, another photo of him. And the bride and the groom were, um, were sitting up on, on a throne, on a stage. Uh, the photographers were videoing everything. The, um, of course, Getting your daughter prepared for a wedding in India begins when she's born, practically. There's a huge investment in just the gold that she is wearing on her, uh, on her outfit. Joined by family members. And then the wedding guests are also dressed up, some of them quite formally. It's a, time, it's a time to invite everybody that you know, everybody that you know, to the, to the reception. These young guys were having a good time. And there's food all over the place. This was taken at a, a hotel. Um, there was a Sikh wedding that was um, wedding party that was getting together. And uh, these folks were really, really dressed to the nines. Um, the groom makes an entrance, perhaps you heard, on a, on a horse. Um, and so we were, <laughs> once in a while you'd go out into the streets and you'd hear all this drum beating and music going and you realize, oh, there's something wedding related going on here. So we found this, uh, the groom who was seated on his white horse and they seemed to have a, a young boy in front of them as well. I'm not sure what the symbol for that is. The horse is all decorated and treated quite nicely, and he's surrounded by 
friends and family. And eventually he will make his way on horseback to the, um, to the wedding site. The women are dressed beautifully and having a good time dancing. Uh, this, this fellow's job was to set off firecrackers uh, on the route to celebrate the, the event. And then we saw another one in the evening um, has a slightly different look to it because they had a, a band that was marching with them and the band was, um, was a brass band and they had folks whose job it was to carry <coughs> uh, lights and the wires that you see attached to a truck at the front that had the generator so the lights could, <laughs> could go. And you got into the party. And I, I wanted to, uh, I want to see if I can. Um, see if I can. So this is the procession. having people join the procession. And of course, this is all happening on the street, so if you can imagine a small street in Farmington and you've got the traffic going and you've got the horses there and the, and the band and people moving all over the place, it, it's, it's a scene. such a stunning building. Um, some of you may know that it was built as a um, mausoleum uh, for the, the wife of one of the rulers. And the wife was um, and followed her husband to a site where they were having some battles and she was carrying her 13th child and ended up um, uh, dying uh, either uh, related to the childbirth. So um, he built this amazing building. Um, it was built in 1631, and it took about 20 years for the whole building plus the grounds to get created. It's a, it's a masterwork of symmetry, and um, all of the white is marble. This, this photo was actually taken from the backside. There is a park that looks over the river, uh, and it, we were there the first day and weren't able to get in but all of the red that you see down at the bottom is a red sandstone, and it's, it's almost as dramatic seeing it from the, the back as it is from the front. These, um, you can see this, this building over here, and then there's another one that's, that you can see over here, and then there's a third one over to the right. The three gates, which provide symmetry for, um, for viewing the tide. We're actually going to go through, this is the main gate over here. And there is the main gate. It's got um, inscriptions in Arabic calligraphy up on the side here. And for this particular one, I, I think I'll just read this one to you. Um, it comes from the Quran. It says, O soul, thou art at rest Return to the Lord at peace with him, and he at peace with you. And again, the details in the architecture are quite amazing. I'd like to, I'd like to see if I can um, take you for a walk through that gate. Um, so this is my wife. 
so you can see what it looks like to actually come upon it for the first time. My little iPhone, so oh. it just sort of appears in this frame, and as many pictures as you may have seen, it, it's it's much better in person. <laughs> Did it seem to you that most tourists there were Indian or not Indian? There were, there were quite a few Indians there. Yeah. yeah. something like 150 feet off the ground. Again, there are, there are Quranic um, inscriptions, and all of this stuff is inlaid. It's not painted on there. So all of the, the dark stone uh, that you see there has been carved out and then inlaid into the marble. It's quite elaborate, and we're told that as you look up, there is an optical illusion, so that um, it's actually it's actually not the same all the way up, but it's built so that when you look up, it looks as though it's the same width all the way up and down. And some people take silly pictures. <laughs> Every, everybody's doing this. I. Um, I had a chance to, uh, to go on a balloon ride um, when we got to uh, Jaipur. There's a, there's a famous place there called the Amr Fort, and it's a pretty spectacular place. We were able to um, get in a balloon and float over it. And at sunrise, it was quite spectacular. There, there's the equivalent, what seemed to me like the Great Wall of China that was, that was part of the fortress area see up on the hills there are walls going all up and down these, these peaks. This is a garden that's down at the base of, of, of the fort. It also was part of the water delivery system that brought water into the fort. And we flew over um, some agricultural land and eventually landed in a small village and of course everybody to see what was going on. And you know, this is just, this is some unannounced visit. And just look at the colors on the people are wearing. But this is the fort. It's stunning. Um, you could make your way up on elephant. Um, it's not a great life for the elephants, but uh, they start down below and curve their way up and eventually make their way into a large courtyard. And they're all decorated. Uh, this was a, um, this is one of the main gates that took you into some of the residential areas. But there's so much detail in it. I mean, it's just, it's hard to believe. This was a special place in, uh, called the Shish Mahal. And uh, all of the, the ceiling was covered with these little mirrors, the little reflecting uh, surfaces. And the story is that um, 
the, the, the young women would dance in there for their Maharaja um, with candles so that at night all of this stuff would reflect. Um, we went out to a place called Kajaraho. Kajaraho is, um, is a little further inland. And these temples, um, these are Hindu temples, these were built uh, somewhere in the 9th or 10th century. And originally, uh, they think there were 85 temples that were present on, this, on these grounds, and now there are about 25. Some of them are, are just amazingly well preserved. Um, it was very, <clears throat> we were there early in the morning, so again, it was very peaceful. All of the detail, and, and these are all, um, this all has uh, symbolism, for example, the onion dome on the right would represent the, um, the Muslim presence, and the others also have some symbolism. But it's still used. People come, and some of them come to look, and some of them come to pray. The, the one on the left um, is one of the main temples, and some people uh, say it looks a little bit like a mountain, and, it, it, and if it does, it's supposed to be the mountain that, um, uh, that Shiva uh, lives on. <coughs> but what's really interesting about these are the carvings. Amazing detail. And you can see in the middle of this, there are all kinds of carvings that are going on, and we're going to take a look at, at just some of them. It's just hard to believe. And there's our friend Ganesh. Now, one of the things that this um, this temple is known for, or this, this area is known for, are these erotic carvings. And sometimes that's the only thing people know about this. It turns out that the, these carvings um, do not constitute a large percentage of what's going on. But there are some that are, that are quite sensuous. The women are all sensuously carved. And there are some that suggest a little bit more than that. <laughs> and um, the question is, you know, why why are there so many of these? What, what was the purpose of doing that? And some, some people feel like it's, um, it, it could have been just a, a love manual for, for people. It could be uh, celebrating the marriage between Shiva and his wife, Parvati. Um, or it could be just celebrating life and creation. The guy that we had here, uh, I'll subscribe to that last version. This is actually another temple, but it, some of the carvings are similar. And this one you may have seen. This is a pretty iconic uh, carving, but it does not come from the same grouping that we were just at. Um, I'm a little conscious of time. Uh, it's, it's almost 8, and I don't want to hold you up. But let me run through some of these a little more quickly, um, because there are other a couple of other architectural things that I thought you'd be interested in seeing. This is something called Kitab Minar, which is a, um, the largest stone tower in India. It's quite spectacular. It was built over hundreds of years, was destroyed in part by lightning. Colors. And it was actually part of a larger complex, a religious complex. I'm not sure if services uh, continue to go there, but it's, it's well visited. And maybe you've seen this, if you've seen the Marigold Hotel movies. Uh, this is 
Uh, this is called the Hawa Mahal, or the Palace of the Winds. It's actually quite interesting because although it's five stories tall, it's only one room deep, and it really is just a facade, and the reason for it, and it's also not terribly old, it, it was built in the 1800s, but um, presumably it was an area for the women to go up and see what was going out on the street without being seen, so they could climb up and look out through some of these, <coughs> through some of these windows. But it's quite striking. It, it, um, it just sort of appears in the middle of a street that otherwise wouldn't be very distinctive. Another place that was brand new to me was um, something called the Step Well. Um, this was, um, I, I don't know how old this was. Oh, it's, it's like ninth century, ninth century. And it was a complex that included a well that filled up with water and people used it in their village. And this was, this was it. The steps that were going down, you could, depending on where the water was at any particular time, you could go down and get your water and, and move out. It was surrounded by these arcades that were filled with statuary. Again, the, the, the picture doesn't do the scale justice, I don't think. So if I could, um, if, are you okay if, my, if we go over just a little bit? Um, I wanted to give you a sense of what it was like to, to contrast life in the village and life in the city and, and middle class life a little bit. So we, we did get a chance to go visit the village and most of the people are living in villages. This one happened to be um, pretty well off, but people, um, do a lot of their stuff outside. The cooking is done outside, depending on the season. The sleeping can be done outside. It's multi-generational. Not too many helicopter parents here. I think <laughs> the kid just gets used to being where they be. They're rolling out the chapati in the morning. People are carrying water to the well. There was a well there that supplied them with actually water that seemed quite warm. <laughs> have to get the laundry done. Um, the domesticated buffalo were the, were the animal of choice. It provided, uh, they provided milk. And the dung was also um, saved and, and, uh, and dried out and used for fuel. We saw this newborn, um, we, we passed by just moments after mom had given birth here. This was just walking down to the school we were going to visit. This is a different village, but I, I'm putting this in here because I wanted you to see the stove. Um, the fuel is not terribly elaborate. Gets the job done. The chapati is, um, is rolled out and then it's put in the pan heat up and then after that it's taken put on the fire pretty directly and it pops up and you get this this pita bread look it just happens kind of magically although there's some there's supposed to be some trick to doing it so that you have to make sure that one side is a little warmer than the other and it depends which side you put on but it didn't look hard when they did it here are some of the the buffalo dung getting dried out sometimes it's put on the roof of the house sun is. So we were going through the village, noticed the, um, the dishes, got to have TV, convenience store, and we, we went to visit a school. This is one of the schools that uh, the organization that we traveled with supports. And this class happened to be outside. I think they were the lucky ones. The, the we also went to visit some classes downstairs. Young man, he'll be a movie star. He'll, he'll be in Bollywood. <laughs> downstairs, there were there was quite a range from um, probably kids who were three or four years old to some kids who were high school age. And one of the real um, marks for the school, the real uh, 
points of pride, I think, was that they were getting a lot of young women uh, to come in and, and go to school. The boys have one approach to picture taking. This is my wife talking to some of the girls, but uh, they're, they're quite different. Um, there's a women's cooperative that that, um, that resides in a place called Donk. Uh, you can actually look this up online, and they sell their goods online. But they do a lot of textile work here, and it, it was a pretty fascinating place. The women from the villages can come in and find work uh, at this place, and they can come in and do piece work uh, on site. I think they can also do some at home as well. But they produce. Fabrics that are just gorgeous. And some of them do block printing, which is which is a big art form. And some do embroidery. And some sew. So pretty modern machines. There's always the old and the new. 